Hello again. Let me introduce you to Lavenham in Suffolk, which is said to be one of the best preserved medieval wall towns in England. The half-timbered buildings were built largely between 1450 and 1500. They were either wealthy merchants' houses or weavers' cottages. Founded on that weaving industry, Lavenham, despite its small size, was said to be the 14th richest town in England at that time. It paid more taxes than York or Lincoln. However, within a century, Dutch refugees in nearby Colchester were producing a cheaper, lighter and more fashionable cloth and the wool industry in Lavenham began to fail. Many of the buildings in Lavenham today date from the Tudor period, but due to that failure of the weaving industry, many were never altered. As a result, the town is very much on the same scale as it was in the 15th century. Within the glories of this village, there are three jewels, the church, the guild hall, and the Swan Hotel. During my recent three-day visit to the town, it rained almost continuously. This prevented me from videoing the church or the guild hall, and I had to concentrate on the Swan Hotel. This building in the middle of the town dates back from at least 1425. But jump forward to the 20th century and we find that it has become a pilgrimage for American tourists. The reason for this is explained by this video. So join me where English and American history meet in this English Tudor village. Twenty-first century traffic passes the medieval houses, hardly giving them a second thought. So we will take a slower walk down Church Street to appreciate their individual characters, structure and pastel colours. A number of houses like this one are pargeted. Largely confined to the counties of Suffolk and Essex, this is a decorative or waterproofing plaster applied to many half-timbered buildings of the 16th century. Further down Water Street is the De Vere House, the fictional birthplace of Harry Potter. And here's another example of pargeting. Many of the houses are jetted, with the upper floors stretching out over the pavements to give more space to the upper floors. With so many half-timbered buildings in the village, the occasional Georgian house seems positively modern.
At the bottom of Church Street, we meet the High Street again and the Swan Hotel. This is the front entrance to the hotel, but before going in, we will take a short walk around the hotel to enjoy more of the architecture of the village before using the back entrance from the car park. As we make our way towards the back entrance of the hotel, I would ask you to stay until the end of the video to hear an account of a very brave man who gave his life to save others in the skies of the Second World War. It's mid-November now, but in the summer, this garden must be very relaxing. We make our way into the hotel through the 487th Brasserie. You will learn about the 487th as we get to know the hotel better. Having checked in at reception, I am taken to my room across a small courtyard at the back. If you've enjoyed this video so far, please consider hitting the subscribe or like button. It keeps my enthusiasm up. I think I'm going to be very comfortable here. Now it's time to start exploring the hotel. The overall feeling I get is of a very friendly rabbit warren. This is one of two private function rooms. As I mentioned in my introduction, it rained. 
Having come in through the informal brasserie, we now find ourselves in the main gallery restaurant. Which had been one of the main weaving halls of the town in medieval times. But look at that for a full English breakfast. And here we are at the point of pilgrimage for so many American servicemen. The Airman's Bar. This was a place of relaxation for so many American airmen of the 487th Bombardment Group during the Second World War, based at Lavenham Airfield, just a few miles away. Keep an eye on that photograph on the left as you view the fascinating memorabilia in the bar. We will come back to him later. As well as the cap badges and shoulder flashes, there are many, many more mementos of the United States 8th Air Force. Make a note of that leather sofa against the far wall. These are hundreds of signatures on the tobacco-stained plasterwork now preserved behind this glass panel. On the other side of the fireplace are the signatures of those airmen and their families who've been making the pilgrimage to this bar ever since. One of these was Big Shorty Codman, who continued to make that journey almost every year until he died just before his 95th birthday, when his family donated his favourite sofa to the bar in his memory. Big Shorty made it back but this man didn't. It was his photograph I pointed out earlier. His name was Fred Castle, and he was a great friend of the landlord of the Swan at that time. It was from Lavenham Airfield that Brigadier General Frederick Castle took off to lead the largest 8th Air Force mission of the war, in which 1,400 bombers escorted by 726 fighters, was to bomb 11 German airfields east of the Rhine. En route to the target, the failure of one engine forced him to relinquish his place at the head of the formation. In order not to endanger family troops below, he refused to jettison his bombs to gain speed and manoeuvrability. His lagging, unescorted aircraft became the target of numerous enemies, enemy fighters, which ripped the left wing with cannon shells, set the oxygen system afire, and wounded two members of the crew. Repeated attacks started fires in two engines, leaving the flying fortress in imminent danger of exploding. Realising the hopelessness of the situation, 
General Castle gave the bailout order. Without regard to his personal safety, he gallantly remained alone at the controls to afford all other members of the crew an opportunity to escape. Still another attack exploded the gasoline tanks in the right wing and the bomber plunged earthward, carrying General Castle to his death. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for taking control of the plane to permit other crew members to bail out and refusing to jettison the plane's bomb load to avoid casualties to civilians or friendly troops below. He was just 30 years old. The date was Christmas Eve, 1944.